Man, I love that. I do. Goodness, that is awesome. I would ask you to do it again, but I know y'all going to do it again next week or so, huh? Man, that is great. I love that. Do you guys? I wasn't even watching you. Did you, did you get into that? I was. They were doing it. Man, I'm telling you, boy, when you do that, uh, I mean, you know, the, the sign language is, uh, is such a, um, you know, it's such a demonstrative thing. And especially when you're praising or you're worshiping, a lot of the times when you use uh, signs, symbols, uh, like you, if you were speaking to, to the deaf, you would use a sign, and it's so descriptive looking, you know? Like, like you know, my hands are open, yeah, and my heart is free, and then open the heavens, and then rain down on me. And I, I, I love that bounce, the way it goes, rain down on me, fall down on me. Well, Tanya goes, fall down on me. I can even get in the rhythm of that. <laughs> That's a miracle, you know. And Justin, boy, so good. I, they all, they just do so good. And uh, I, I love them, and they bless me every time they sing. I, I told Tanya, I said, y'all hadn't done a, a, what I would call a dud yet. And by a dud, by a dud, I mean, one that you just really can't get with, you know, you just, it just, it might even be a good song, but you just can't get with it as a congregation. All the songs they do just are, a lot of them are more wordy than others, and, you know, a lot of them have verses that are a little tangled up, you know, with the way you have to learn the words, but the choruses are always easy, and, and, and they say great things and encourage you to believe great things and say great, gives the great theology. So anyway, we praise the Lord. All right, so we're back to now away in the wilderness. You remember from, well, last week was Easter. And uh, before Easter, we did, I was talking to you out of uh, Isaiah 35, which is a messianic chapter, obviously. And it just talks about the Messiah. And it tells us great things because remember when Isaiah wrote this, Jesus, it would be 700 years before Jesus came. So when Isaiah wrote this, Israel was looking forward to a Messiah. Now, when we read it, we are looking back on the fact that 2,000 years ago, our Messiah did, did come. So our perspectives are a little different, but we can see a lot of, now we can see the fulfillment of these prophecies in, in a much deeper way because we have the privilege of uh, being able to look back in historical things and we can see what's happening now and we, we know that Christ came and what he did and all of those things. And they were just anticipating this. And Isaiah said, when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring some benefits for you so that you won't have to walk through these desert, dry, barren, um, uh, wilderness areas of your life. I, mean, I, I just wonder, do you, do, you, do you have any dry areas in your life? I mean, do you, do you have any areas that just seem barren and, and they're, they're always difficult for you and, and you have problems in those areas and, and they just continually seem to plague your life and it's always something in, in, that, in that area of your life? Well, that, that's a dry area. That's a wilderness. That's a barren land. It's a desert in our life. And so Isaiah says, look, uh, there's a Messiah coming. And when he comes, he's going to bring some benefits that are going to conquer or allow you to conquer these dry areas in your life. And the first one, you remember, was strength. And I told you that God strengthens your life in three ways, three simple ways. He makes your feeble hand, I mean, he makes your hands that hang down, he strengthens them, which is by, that's worship. So worship is one of the tools God uses to help give you strength in these dry places of life. And then he says he, he, he firms up your feeble knees, which is prayer, and he uses prayer to strengthen you in these weak, dry areas of your life. And then he said he's gonna, he's gonna make your fearful heart courageous. And he uses his word to make your fearful heart courageous. He makes promises to you and he says things to you. So many times he said, do not be afraid. And, you know, the Bible's filled with that. And so he strengthens us. And then the second thing that he, that he did, we talked about signs. And when the Messiah comes, he's gonna do signs and wonders. 
And wonders, I tell you, remember I told you I love the word wonder because I don't know what it really is. The only thing I can say is it, it, it's something God does that just kind of makes you wonder, you know, really. I know that sounds simplistic, but that, that's all I know a wonder would be. It would be something God does that you just, you, don't, you can't figure it out. You just have to wonder about it. Miracles is what we're talking about. And so we know that when Jesus came, he did miracles. And we know that God does miracles today and that God has all kinds of things that happen in our life from some things that are barely noticed to giant things that everybody knows about, uh, physical things in our life that get healed, emotional things, mental things, relational things, family things, financial things. I mean, God, God just does great things and miracles. Doors open for us. We get favor. Uh, we, you know, you, you get a job you shouldn't have. What is that? Favor of God. Uh, is that a miracle? Well, if you're the one needing it, it is, right? <laughs> Your family thinks it is because they get to eat tonight rather than go hungry, right? So anyway, God does sign. God, in, in, in the dry places of our life, he does miraculous things. And so today now we come to the third uh, benefit that the Messiah brings with him to affect our life in these dry places of life. And we're gonna talk about streams today. You know, I, I know some of you, especially if you've been around church a long time, you know pastors do this kind of thing. They start everything with the same letter. Have you, you, y'all have noticed that, right? Why, why do we do that? Mm. I, well, I always used to think, well, it helps them remember better, but it doesn't, um, I don't think. It's just, a, it's just a little tool that, you know, that we do. We strength, signs, streams, another S next week. Um, but he's talking about streams that God brings in our dry places. Let's read Isaiah 35. I'm gonna start with verse one. It doesn't, hear, it doesn't hurt you to hear these verses over again. All right. The, <laughs> the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. Lebanon wasn't a country back then. It was a just a fertile place in Canaan. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon, like the rose of Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Here it is. That's the strength. Better. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Great, great strength God brings. Then miracles. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like the deer and the tongue of the dumb will sing. So miraculous things, signs and wonders. And here come the waters. For waters, this is the last part of verse six. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and a thirsty land and, and, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, which is just the Bible's way of saying where desert animals live, okay? So where desert animals live. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So there are gonna be pools like, like lakes, pools in the desert of water. And there's gonna be so much that reeds are gonna grow and, and, and grass is gonna grow around the edge. It's just a miraculous thing. Now, there are a couple of other passages that I wanna read two or three verses out of that say basically the same kind of thing in Isaiah. And just, just bear with me, I, I love the word. I could, read, I could read 25 verses, but th let me just read three or four of them to you, all right? Uh, uh, here's a couple, one. Isaiah 41, verse 17 through 20. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in the desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. 
I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. And here's one you might be very familiar with, Isaiah 43, but forget all that. God said, forget all that. All of that stuff that used to be, forget all of that. That's nothing compared to what I'm gonna do. For I'm about to do a brand new thing. <laughs> I've already begun, don't you see it? <laughs> no, we don't see it, we're blind as a bat. Yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make new pathways through the wilderness. This is, this is the word of God I, I, for my people to come home. And I'll create rivers for them in the desert. You know, I, I guess I'm on a campaign this morning, and, and I guess you can tell I'm kind of fired up about this. To, to encourage us that when we read verses like this, that we don't just yawn as we pass by them. Like they're nothing, like, like, like it just said nothing to us that is exciting or, or captivating for us. Now, these are miraculous things. I mean, you know, streams in the desert. Have, have any of you ever been in the desert? Boy, if you had had a stream in the desert, that would be a miracle. Good night. Or rivers in the desert? Are pathways, roads, uh, uh, places that were easy to, tr to traverse through the desert? Good night. Those are miraculous things. And so in, in these passages of Scripture, God's promising uh, something new for them, something they've never experienced before that is going to be so overwhelming it just can be compared to a, a river flowing through them, a stream in the desert, rough place. So I'm gonna to submit to you just quickly that this prophecy, as well as many other prophecies, most other prophecies actually, have two fulfillments. They have a natural fulfillment and they have a spiritual fulfillment. So let, let me just talk to you. I, I, I wrote this, those of you that picked up the, the listening guide or the handout when you came in, you have what I'm about to read to you. But listen to it. This is just, this is a, the natural fulfillment of what Isaiah just said. This is like live right now happening right now in Israel. When Israel became a nation, May 14, 1948, the desert blossomed like a rose. That dry, barren, empty wasteland became a garden of God. Listen to this. Uh, when you look at Israel today, it's a garden in the middle of a desert. Every nation around Israel, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, Kuwait, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, the Sudan, Ethiopia, all of those nations are basically deserts. Seth Siegel, who is a Jewish writer, by the way, but not a Christian, and he wasn't writing for a Christian publication, he's a scientist. Seth Siegel is the author of Let There Be Water, a book about how Israel became a water superpower. He, he writes, what people want to learn is how a country that is 60% desert and, and the country's only about from here to Columbus, Mississippi long and here to Hattiesburg wide. That's how big a country Israel is, a whole country. That's the whole country. And 60% of it is desert. Now listen to this. How a country that is 60% desert and whose population increased tenfold since 1948 so they have 10 times as many people there now as they had in 1948. Not only has enough water for itself, but in fact has such a surplus that it exports water to its neighbors 
In addition, Siegel goes on to point out that Israel provides large amounts of water from its own supplies to both the Palestinians and the Jordanians and exports billions of dollars each year of peppers, tomatoes, melons, and other water-intensive produce. All of that produce has to have lots of water to work right. How does this happen? In a desert, a 60% dry land now has so much water, it exports water to all of its neighbors. And it has become the breadbasket of the Middle East. Israel and the United States are the only two countries on earth that can feed themselves and export to others. Well, we know what happened, don't we? We know what Isaiah said was going to happen when the Messiah comes. And he said, when the Messiah comes, the deserts are going to run with streams and, and, and the barren places are going to have pools of water on them. And it just described this lush land in the middle of a desert. And this is the natural fulfillment of this prophecy. You can look at it, you can go to Israel right now, and if you flew over Israel, it would be a luscious garden, green, beautiful oasis of a land in the middle of a, of a, of a stark desert all around it. And that's what Isaiah said was going to happen when the Messiah came. But there's also a spiritual fulfillment of this. And the spiritual fulfillment, listen, this is what God wanted to do. All the way through the Old Testament, you wonder, what is in the world all this stuff about sacrifices and you gotta go to the temple and you gotta you know, put the blood on the altar and you gotta do this and you gotta sacrifice the perfect lamb and then you, can't, you gotta get all the leaven out of your house. I mean, all that kind of stuff, all that kind of stuff. You want, if you ever wonder, what in the world is that all about? God was trying to illustrate to his people what it meant to be spiritually right with him and to prepare them for a Messiah that would come so that when he came, they would recognize him by the, by the things that he said and the things that he did, they would go, so that's why we've been doing that for 2,000 years. Oh my goodness, there's Jesus. He's the Messiah. But of course, they failed. But God, God gives these words so that we can know what's happening. And, and, here's, here's, and so it has a spiritual fulfillment. And just so you'll know, okay, I'm not just up here making up stuff and that things do have a spiritual fulfillment. Let me just read a couple of verses, Isaiah 58, verse 11, just to show you how, what it says. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. All right, there's the Lord saying, this drought is, is talking about your soul. It's talking about you, you dry on the inside. It's talking about your life is dry and I'm gonna revive your soul with this drought. There you go, it goes on. And strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. See, that's God saying, when I'm talking about these springs of water and streams of water, it's, this is you. He says, you are that well water spring. You are that water that springs. Out. And I'm just showing you that God uses this kind of language to talk to us even today, all right? Jer Jeremiah 31, 12 Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd. Their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. That's an that's a amen, good. That's a, 
That was a good amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm looking for that time where I'm not going to sorrow anymore. How about you? But, I, but see, th- I'm just showing you that God says that these analogies and metaphors and similes, that all of these uh, are to show you something about you. It's not just natural stuff. It's, it's spiritual stuff that relates to you and your life and, and all those things. So obviously, when God is talking to us about streams of water that are flowing in our life that are going to strengthen us, he's talking talking to us about spiritual water in a spiritual sense, about spiritual water that's going to strengthen us and satisfy us and encourage us uh, in the middle of our wildernesses, our deserts, and, and the dry places of our life. See, God has never had trouble providing water for his people. Just think back in the scripture, for 40 years, God brings the whole nation of Israel Many Bible scholars believe there were as many as three million people, even if it was only half of that, a million and a half. Across the desert, no water, no food, no housing. What? A million and a half. God, and for 40 years, God watered them and fed them and kept them safe and protected them and kept them alive for 40 years. Moses was told what by God? Speak to the rock. And if you speak to the rock, water is going to come out of the rock. And so Moses spoke to the rock. I don't know what Moses said to the rock, but whatever he said, as soon as he said it, water started coming out of the rock. Now in the New Testament... The Apostle Paul tells us that that rock that Moses spoke to was Jesus Christ and that that rock followed them. Ah, I see, disbelief. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 3. Here it is. Moreover, brethren, now Paul's talking to them about all the sacrifices that were made by the people in the Old Testament. All the saints of the Old Testament, they sacrificed, they were all together. That's what this verse is about, but look at it. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. That's the Shekinah glory cloud of God. That's the supernatural air conditioner that kept them from burning up in the daytime in the desert, by the way. And then he had a heater at night, a pillar of fire. Miracles. They all were baptized on the cloud. They all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, I don't know what they thought when, they, when a rock was following them around in the desert. They look back and here comes the rock following them around. No, you know, that's, I'm, I'm picking about that. I'm just funny with you that. No, you, you know what that's talking about. It, it's talking about what God wanted them to uh, relate that rock to. God wanted them to relate the fact that he gave water out of a rock to the fact that he could give a Messiah that would bring refreshing and reviving in their life. And when they saw the Messiah, they would think of the rock that, 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 that gave them water and life in the desert. That's literally what he's saying. But when we talk about springs of water and rivers of water, you know, you, you got to understand that there is a natural fulfillment that literally there is something, God did something, and he's still doing something in the land of Israel for his people that involved natural water that still baffles scientists to this day. They don't know where the water came from. They don't know why it's there. They don't know how it got there. They don't know how it came to the surface and why it never happened before. They're just baffled by everything that has to do with all this water that's in Israel. But he also does something spiritual to you and I that will give us life and vitality in the hard, dry places of our life. Let me give you a refrigerator verse. Did I put that on a slide? Yeah, yeah, here it is. Here's one for your refrigerator. Even though I live in a fallen world, I don't have to live a dry life. Yeah, I don't have to live in a dry land just because I live in a fallen world. And that's what 
the Messiah came to deliver us from. I can live where a river of living water flows. So let me give you a couple of spiritual fulfillments concerning water in our dry places. All right, fulfillment number one. The Holy Spirit is a river of living water that flows in and out of us. Jesus is a river of water. Jesus brought the Holy Spirit who is a river of water that, run, that flows in our life and then flows through our life and flows out of our life. That Jesus brought the Holy Spirit into our lives. And the Holy Spirit is not just a stream now. The Holy Spirit is a river. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, there is an event that happens that I'm sure just whoop, flies right over our heads until now. It's an amazing thing. Let me give you a little background before I read a couple of verses. They're very familiar verses, and you'll see them. But to give you the background before we get there, the Jews are the only people on earth who God gave them their holidays. And he gave them seven of them. Three in the spring, one in the summer, three in the fall. The last one in the fall is called the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Feast of Tabernacles, they would build booths or homes, little lean-tos or tents outside their homes. And for seven days, they would go out and live in those little lean-tos and booths, remembering how God had led them through the wilderness for 40 years. And so every year, the last feast of the year, called the Great Feast, was the Feast of Tabernacles, and it lasted for seven days. And on that seventh day, they would do two things. They would pray for two things. They would pray for rain, and they would pray for the Messiah to come. Because they understood what Isaiah said in Isaiah 35, that when the Messiah comes, there's going to be plenty of water. Now, if you live in a desert land, the only thing you're concerned about is water. You can't live without water. Water is the most precious resource of all. You can die in three days with uh, gold stacked all around your body without water. Water is precious. And so they prayed, may the Messiah come, because when the Messiah comes, Isaiah says, there's going to be plenty of water all over the desert. And so on the last day of the Feast of Passover, they took a Roman flagon, which uh, is a pitcher, like a pitcher, you know, and it's got that nice shape and the little spout and the curvy and the curvy handle back here. They, they took it and they went down to the pool, pool of Siloam and they put that flagon in this pool of Siloam and filled it up with water. They brought it back to the temple, marched it back to the temple, playing the shofar as they marched. They went into the temple, they went to the altar in the temple, and they poured that water onto the altar of the temple, and they prayed while they were pouring the water, Lord, we're praying for water, and we're praying for the Messiah to come. And on his last time on earth, here's what Jesus did during that ceremony. Remember, they're pouring that water and they're praying for water and the Messiah. John 7, 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus, remember they're standing there pouring and praying, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying, you're praying for the Messiah. Here I am. You're praying for water. I got a river of living water. Here I am. Just good staging, man. I mean, God is so genuine. It's just amazing how he does stuff. But this he spoke, now listen to this. 
The next verse says, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit. When he said this river of living water, John says he's, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. This he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So see, Jesus brought the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not work in anybody's life until Jesus was crucified, went back to heaven, sprinkled the, his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, and then the Holy Spirit could be dispatched to indwell our lives. And this river of water that he's talking about is the Holy Spirit in your life to empower you and refresh you and revive you and strengthen you and empower you to do those things that God has called you to do. So, so Jesus came so that you could have a dynamic, powerful river in you, flowing through you, flowing out of you, flowing into you, and... And, and, and that river has a name, and his name is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and like a river of life flowing in you, the Holy Spirit just is gushing inside of you. One of the reasons why Israel has so much water nowadays is because of three springs. In the north of Israel, in the north country of Israel, there are three springs up there that have been just pouring out water, like fire hydrant. The people, I've had, I have some pastor friends that have seen it, and they say, it, it, Keith, it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It, it's like fire hydrants coming up out of, I mean, it doesn't look like fire hydrants coming out of the ground, but it's like, it's, it's water coming out of the ground that looks like it's coming out of a fire hydrant. Big, big, gushing, bold strength, three of them just flood, just pouring out millions of gallons of water 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and has been doing that for year after year after year after year. How did they get there? God put them there. They just, they're just there. Have any of you ever seen a spring? When you see it, it looks like it's just, it's just there. It's just water coming up out of the ground or coming out the side of a hill. I mean, it, it's, no, it's like, how is the water just coming out of the ground like that? There's no structure. There's no element around here. There's no faucet. There's no, I mean, it's just water just, just coming up out of the ground. It just seemed like for no reason, it just bubbles right up out of the ground there. In the community where I grew up, where my church was actually, um, we had, they, there was a spring off the edge of the highway down a little embankment. There was a spring down there. And of course, I'm talking about in the 60s and 70s, it's almost a long time ago. People would bring buckets and pitchers and uh, cans and, and milk jugs, all that kind of stuff, and just go down in that water and just put that bucket in there and they'd just fill that whole bucket up with that fresh, nice spring water and they'd carry it back home and use it. Man, they didn't have to go to the store and buy, buy a bubble spring water that probably came out of a hose in his backyard. They got the real thing and they just use it. And it but it was the most amazing thing because it just never ran dry. It, it, you could fill it up, fill up, fill up, and it just kept on flowing. It, it just like a, a never-ending flow of water. Well, how did it get there and who did it? Well, God did it. And Isaiah is saying, when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring a stream into a dry wilderness, desert, barren place, dry place of your life, and it's going to gush up like, like a spring does. It's going to be cool and refreshing, and it's going to revive you, and it's going to, it's going to soothe you and ease you in this parched area of your life. And that spring is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Greek word for Holy Spirit is the word pneuma. 
a description of what the Holy Spirit is is a word that we use, you hear it quoted uh, quite often out of John 14, where it says, uh, where Jesus says, I'll pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter. That word comforter is, is parakletos, from which we get our English word paraclete. But parakletos is the word that describes the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, what the Holy Spirit is, is para which means to come alongside, and kletas means to walk. So what the, whole, the description of the Holy Spirit's work in your life is that the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and walks with you through life. I mean, would it be okay with you? Would it be okay with you if the Holy Spirit just came and walked with you wherever you went? Like when you had that meeting at work tomorrow, he would just be right there beside you, walking right along with you. Or when you had that big event that was coming up and all that stress and stress, uh, stress and strife and pressure, would it be okay if the Holy Spirit just came and walked right beside you and right before you? The word parakletos has been uh, translated in some newer translations, and I don't have anything against that. I use stuff all the time. Uh, all, a lot of the newer translations, they're great. But the word's been translated like helper, uh, advocate, counselor, intercessor, words like that. But the old King James Version, which is what I grew up with, and what I, most of the verses I, I have memorized come out of the old King James Version of the Bible, uh, uses the word comforter. Now, let me do a little silly thing here, but I do have a point. Do any of you have a comforter on your bed? You have a comforter? You know, Tanya and I have been married 43 years in, in uh, July. I mean, in August, it'll be 44 years. Mar married a long time. We've, we've had comforters. When we first got comforters, I thought that they were something that you slept under. You know, I, I'm thinking when I'm going to see in the bed and it's got this nice, beautiful comforter on top of it. And... Uh, I'm thinking, hot dog, boy, it's gonna be nice tonight. And uh, I pull it up and Tanya said, what, what are you doing? And she would take it away out of my hands and put it on the floor. I'm thinking, what in the world, man? We got our, got our comforter on the floor? And here's what she would tell me. She would tell me, that's not for use, that's for looks. So, <laughs> just as a, as a good report, I have finally gotten her, I think I've shamed her enough and, 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 and criticized and griped about it enough that, and it only took me 43 years, um, that we have finally now a comforter on our bed that we actually can use. And we actually use the comforter to pull up. But I hadn't been able to do anything with the pillows. I mean, I, I, got, the, I got the comforter. We have, right now, I have seven pillows on, on right now. You go to our house, there are seven pillows on that bed. Uh, we sleep on two of them. And we put five of them on the floor every night. But uh, somehow, you know, it, it's there. Though, I, if, if, it, if there were only men on this earth, there would be no comforters and there would be no throw pillows on the bed. They would, those companies would go out of business because we just really don't see any need for that. But, 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 but my point is th this thing of, uh, of, of looks. It's not for use, it's for looks. Uh, there are other things in our house that through the years we've had to work through that were just for looks and not for use. Uh, I remember one specific example. I, for some reason, had to use the guest bathroom and a shower in the guest, in the guest bathroom. And when I opened a little curtain and was gonna get out, there was a beautiful, new, plump, fresh towel hanging right there on the towel rack. Well, I get it and start trying to dry off with the thing. Tanya, <laughs> Tanya comes in and this evidently was not what this towel was for. This towel was for guest, not for me, right? So you, you actually could use this towel in my house, but I can't use it, but anyway. So I remember, I remember she, the words she said to me out of startle was, what do you think you're doing? 
I said, uh, I'm naked. <laughs> I'm wet. It's pretty cool in here. This is a nice, plump, fresh, nice towel. I guess I'm thinking I ought to use that to dry off with. <laughs> well, that evidently wasn't the right answer. But uh, we worked it all out, and you know, we, 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 we got it all out. We got it, we got it worked all out. But anyway, anyway, back, back, to, my, back to my original, original assertion here about a comforter. Um, I wonder how many Christians today have a Holy Spirit that's not for use. He's just for looks. God gave us the Holy Spirit in our life to use, to be a dynamic part of our life, to be involved in every part of our life, to bring refreshment, to bring relief, like the streams of wonderful water, to empower us, to embolden us, to do everything God has called us to do. All right, so one, one fulfillment of spiritually would be that the Holy Spirit runs in and out of our life. All right, here's the second one, and I only have two, so relax. I'm gonna let you out early. I'm gonna let you out early today. Uh, <laughs> number two, yeah. The Holy Spirit is not weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. I promise you, that's, I've got it written down right there. I'm, I'm just kind of on a campaign uh, about this thing of the way the Holy Spirit works in people's lives. Um, and I'm just saying right now that I want you to understand that uh, to, I don't think that the Holy Spirit is weird. Now, the work that the Holy Spirit does is sometimes mysterious. And it is very, very often misrepresented. All of these stories about stuff and experiences about stuff that if you're not careful, you know, you might kind of back away from the Holy Spirit because you're a little frightened because you think that the Holy Spirit is really weird. And if he gets control of your life, you're going to be speaking in tongues at the supermarket over the loudspeaker or something, you know. <laughs> and somehow he just does wild stuff to you that's uncontrollable in your life. And you really don't have much to do with him because you're really pretty much just afraid of him. Well, in my 47 years of being a Christian, I have been, no, is it 47? Preaching, I think 47, 49, something like that. 49 as a Christian. But anyway, in my, in my long life <laughs> with the Lord, I have been through so much stuff with the Holy Spirit. I have been through every kind of campaign you have ever seen in your life. Every kind of revival, anointing, blessing, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I have been through all of them because I have always sought the Spirit of God and the work of God. And I've never been fearful of it, and it's gotten me into a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of places where something was happening that was supposed to be the Holy Spirit. And I'm going, this is just freaky. Like, I've been in a place that they thought chicken feathers on you meant the Holy Spirit was working in you. Like a little chicken feather, like... Like if you just were up there preaching and all of a sudden there was like a little chicken feather just kind of appeared up here or fell down or something. I don't, I don't know. Here's one. Gold dust. That when you would be preaching and, and, and the Holy Spirit would just be firing through you, all of a sudden you'd get little flecks of gold under here. I've even had people come up and say, oh, pastor, you got gold dust. Come on. That, that stuff still happens nowadays. Here's another one. There was a revival. This was in the, this was in the uh, early 2000s, right down here in, in one of our uh, uh, local Coliseum areas, I think out there in West uh, Harrison, uh, out there one of those uh, community centers, that there was a revival went on all week. 
and I'm not gonna say the man's name because I'm not trying to put down on anybody, but uh, he, he called this revival the laughing revival. Any of you remember the laughing revival? And he, his title for himself was the Holy Ghost bartender. He said, I'm the Holy Ghost bartender. No. And everybody started going, ha, 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 I mean, just laughing like a bunch of wild hyenas. And that was the Holy Spirit supposed to be. Now, look, I'm not, I, I really don't want to make fun of anybody's true convictions. There are some great people that believe the Holy Spirit does work like that. They really love the Lord. They're going to heaven when they die. And they think that that's pretty common for the Holy Spirit to do weird things like that. And I don't want to put down on what, you know, what they do. But it, it, just, it just seems to me that the Holy Spirit has another mission in life than to do weird things that make no sense and have no value. Um, you know, weird people do weird things. And some people are just weird. <laughs> and they would be weird without the Holy Spirit. Speaking of weird, you know there's a poll that's been done, right, where they have found in this poll that one out of every three people in this country are weird. I mean, you, do, do you think that's right? You think that has any validity? One out of three people are weird in this country. All right, well, let's just see. Let's, let's see if we can prove it, all right? All right, now, look to your left. All right, now look to your right. If those people aren't weird, you're the weird one. <laughs> no, y'all know I'm just playing with that. There wasn't any poll about one out of three people being weird. It's really one out of two, really, is what it, what it was. But, but anyway... I grew, up, I grew up in what would be considered a smaller town. It wasn't tiny, but it, you know, it was like about 40,000 people, roughly, 35, 40,000. So it's a smaller town. And in our town, now remember, this is the 60s and, and early 70s. So I grew up in the, I'm growing up in this town, and in our town, we had all kinds of churches. I mean, we had all kind of denominational churches, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Catholic, you know, uh, Lutherans, all of that. And we, we had two types of churches that talked about the Holy Spirit. Now, look, again, I'm not putting down on anybody's thoughts. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm just giving you the perspective of a child, young teenager child, about what I saw. We had two churches in town, two types of churches in town. There were many of each type that talked about the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one, in one of them, uh, <clears throat> I guess the distinction could be made, and I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a kid and I'm trying to make the distinction. And in, in one of the churches, uh, I can remember that the women wore no makeup at all, and in the other one, women wore way too much makeup. Now, I can't remember which one was which, but I remember the hairstyle in one of the churches seemed to be uh, predicated that the higher the, the hair, the closer to heaven you were. Um, because it seemed like that was a really big, important deal, you know, to, to the people that were at that church. So, you know, as a child, I just wondered... As a child, now, I just wondered, and I didn't know the Lord, I wasn't a Christian or anything, and I just wondered, if the Holy Spirit comes into my life, is it, it, will, will I be affected like that? Will that be what becomes really important to me, stuff like that? Well, I've since discovered that that's not the Holy Spirit. That even though these churches are filled with wonderful people, they're gracious, good, kind, nothing wrong with them, beautiful people, 
They, have a, they feel this way. They have a conviction about this, and that's fine. That's, you know, that's not an essential deal to me. That's not a deal breaker in any way about anything. But in, 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 in studying the word and, and, and asking and trying to seek God, I found out that that's not really who, what the, who the Holy Spirit really is. Let me show you who the Holy Spirit really is. And this is Jesus speaking now. In John 16, Jesus is speaking, and he's going to tell us what the Holy Spirit's all about. And listen to this. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. All right. Jesus said to us, I still have many things to say to you. I have a lot of things I want to share with you. But you can't bear them. You can't receive them. However, let me make sure I put that. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, I wish I had underlined every time it says he or him in that verse. It says it a bunch. I tried to emphasize it. But Jesus is saying that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. Why can the Holy Spirit guide you into all truth? Because he knows all truth. He knows everything about everything. He is the third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you can ask him about anything because he knows everything about everything. So remember now, you have someone living inside of you who knows everything about anything you want to know. He's the spirit of truth. He knows all truth. And he can guide you in all truth. And he's committed to you to be your teacher, to be your mentor, to, 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 to lead you through life. So my question is then, why don't we ever talk to him? When's, when's the last time you talked to the Holy Spirit? When's the last time you said anything to the Holy Spirit? You said, Holy Spirit, I know you're there with me. The Word teaches me you're there. I don't know how to do this. I need, teach me to do this. I'm going to tell you something now, and, this is, and I know you're going to think I'm crazy, and you're going to say, oh, Pastor, you just kind of flipped out. I, of course, I, for 25 years, I did only ministry. I was a preacher with an office, and I had a staff, and I did preacher stuff all day, every day, and that's all I did. And I made money and did all that. I didn't have to work another job or anything. Well, when you start a new work like this uh, 11, 12 years ago, <laughs> you got to get a job, you know? Because <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have a big bunch of people that you don't have a big salary and big offerings and big stuff like that, so you have to get a job. Well, I'm 55 years old, and... I, I, you know, I've worked in the ministry. I have a degree in education uh, and a degree in theology, but, uh, you know, I guess about with that and about $1.50 or three fifty or five fifty, depending on where you go, you can get a cup of coffee nowadays. That's about how good it, it did me. But um, I had to get a job. So I went down to a major Fortune 500 company that does, well, I'll just mention it, AT&T. And I applied for a job. Now, did I ever work in that field in my life? Negatory. Did I know anything about that? No, I didn't. I knew how to answer a phone. That's about it. I didn't know anything about anything to do with technology or any of that stuff. I went down there, put my application in. 
they talked to me and said, you know, okay, I think we want you. And they hired me and I didn't know anything. And I'm telling you, you know what I did? I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know anything about this. I want you to teach me about this because you know about this. You know all about electronics. You know all about all this stuff. You know how to do this. And I need to know how, so teach me. And he did. And I went through some classes and things like that. I'm not saying, you know, he just began talking to me and I just said, all right, let me write this down. Uh, I'm just saying that he opened me up to be able to learn this quickly and fully. To, I mean, kid night. It's unbelievable. And then uh, I did the same thing a few years later with a major water company that dealt with deionized water and reverse osmosis and all that kind of stuff. All I knew was that water was wet and I liked to drink it. When I went in there, same thing, same thing. Lord, I got to know about this. I got to, you know, you open the door, it's a good job. Um, it can provide for my family, you teach me. And the Holy Spirit opened me up. And, I, and I'm 55 years old, that's what I'm saying. And I've, I've not done any of this all my life. I'm, all I'm saying to you is, why don't we talk to the Holy Spirit more than we do? Because he's our teacher. He's the spirit of truth. He knows everything about everything. Why don't you ask him how to raise your, your children? Why don't you ask him how to, how to uh, uh, balance your budget? Why don't you ask him where you need to put your resources for retirement? Because he knows everything about everything. And I'm just saying that, you know, you might be smart and you might be educated. You might be both educated and smart. You know, some people are educated above their intelligence, but you know, you, you might be educated and smart, but you don't know everything, but he knows everything. And if you will ask him, he said, the spirit of truth will lead you into all truth. I, you know why I think we don't talk to him more than we do? Because we don't see him as a person. You know, in order to, to, to have a personal relationship with somebody, you have to see them as a person, right? Uh, personal, as in personal relationship, starts with the word what? Person. So in order to have a personal relationship, I've got to see him as a person and not as an it. So many people see the Holy Spirit as an it. And I think that it's because of his name. He doesn't have a personal name, right? All right, God the Father has, he's the Father, that's a person. We can relate to that. God the Son, well his name is Jesus. That's a person. But then you have God the Holy Spirit. That doesn't sound like a person. That sounds like an entity, an it, a, a spirit or something. It's not person, it's not a person. So I think if we could change his name, that it would help us. So what do you want to call him? Fred. Fred. <laughs> yeah, because the, the uh the churches that are real personal and, and, and uh, casual could call him Freddy. Yeah. And the churches that are real formal could say Frederick. Right. And then all of us that are kind of somewhere in the middle, we can call him Fred. Or Bill. Billy. William. Bill. Jim. Jimmy. James. Uh, Bob. Let's see. Bob. Bobby. Robert. Um, we could do a few more, couldn't we? Anyway. Would that help us to be able to... Think of him as a personal, as a person that we can have a personal relationship with. Well, that's silly, really. I know it's silly. Uh, but let me see if I can do any, something to help you right here. Okay, now follow along with me. The Holy Spirit is not his name. The Holy Spirit is his description. God, the Father, is not God's name. It's a description of who he is. God, the Son, is not Jesus' name. It's a description of who he is. And so the Holy Spirit, then, is a description 
of who he is. So what is his name? Well, you have God the Father, you have God the Holy Spirit, and you have God the Son. So what is his name? God. His name is God, you know. And he's a person, and he wants to personally work in your life. Every time you see him in the Bible, I want you to just look at verse 13 and see how many times the Bible never calls the Holy Spirit an it. It's always he. He. And, all right, he. However, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you all things to come. In one verse. What is God saying? Person. This is a person. This is not a thing, it's a person. And, and all, what I'm saying is, this streams of water, these streams of water, the Holy Spirit's not just a stream, he's a river. And God put him in you to work in your life, to work in you, to work through you, to work out of you, to, be, to, to, to lead you into truth, to affect your life. And in these dry places that you keep having trouble with, he is a pool in the middle of these dry places. If you will take advantage of that. If you will respond to this. Now, I'm going to tell you what. When you walk out this, these doors and this afternoon, something hits you. That's a dry place. It's a worry. It's an anxiety. Money, children, house, car, wh whatever it is, a person, neighbor, loved one, whatever it is. And it hits you. This is not going to do you one ounce of good if you don't incorporate it into what's happening. When that hits you, let me tell you what to do. Just say, Holy Spirit, because he's God now. Don't, I mean, he's the same as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're, they're a triune. I can't explain it, but it's, that's it. You're talking to God. You say, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to do. I need for you to teach me what to do, how to respond. What, 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 how can I, what can I do? How can I do this? I, you, it's too much for me. Should, all right, I need you. Teach me all truth about this. And then watch what happens. So many times we pray like that and then we don't pay any attention to what happens. The, God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit in these days that we live in by the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. It doesn't mean that God can't talk to you out of a tree or a cloud or a bird, but that's not usually how God does it these days. These days, God has chosen to speak to us through his spirit, and his spirit communicates usually through his word. Something in the word jumps out at you and speaks to your heart that you've, you've read it a thousand times, but it says something now you never heard before. You come to church and the pastor just gets off somewhere flying on something, and it's just what you need to hear. Uh, a friend, Christian friend, quotes a verse, the Bible. And then when you're praying, you get these sense, you get the sense of something going on, or maybe you begin to think about things and you roll them around in your mind, and, and all of a sudden you look at things in a different way. That's God. Uh, circumstances are a big thing. You know, people think things happen by happenstance. No, no. Uh, circumstances are just a way of God remaining anonymous. Uh, he's doing it. He speaks to you. And then Christian friends. So listen and watch what happens and pay attention. And God will lead you through this thing because that's a river of life flowing out of you. All right, bow your head with me for just one.